Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. Woohoo! I hear okay. some cowbell. All right. I have to tell you, I am super excited to be at this event and presenting about this topic. Derek's going to advance okay. for me because he's not noticing my little nod. Why don't you tell us who would introduce us real quick? Go ahead and introduce us, Derek. Tell them okay. who we are. Uh, my name is Derek Christian. I own a company called My Maid Service in Cincinnati, Ohio. We also have a commercial cleaning operation called ACS Cleaning. And Liz, myself, and another individual are, are part of a group called Service Business Builders. And Liz at, owns a cleaning service in Olympia, Washington called American Maid. So just want to give you a little background on who we are. All righty. So the reason I'm excited is that when you think of a culture of promotion, you don't typically think of cleaning services doing something along those lines. Well, we might, but the vast majority of people don't. They're like, oh, it's just a cleaning service. So I'm excited to see that you guys are on my page, that it is important to be raising our industry and not just doing the least we can possibly do. Why, what's the point of that? So today, we want to talk about a culture of promotion, but I might need to do that. I might oh, need to boss. do this. All right, where's the little button here? Here? The green one. All righty. Culture of promotion. Super small, but it sort of has a big meaning and it gets lost really easily. So I want to break it down a little bit. Culture, what is culture? Culture is what you believe, it's what you do, and it's when you do it. That's all it is. We get stuck in this idea of culture. It's the big watchword. Everybody talks about culture and building a culture and how do you have a better culture? And people are like, I don't know. What's my culture? How do I get it? It's nothing. It's easy. It's this. It's what you believe. It's what you do. And it's when you do it. We're going to be modeling culture for you today because we are part of an organization that believes in a culture of engagement. What we believe is engagement. What we do is we give you something to do. And Derek is going to give you something to do. Yeah. Who out there knows what I might be talking about right now? Let me hear you if you do. Yes, we're going to give you some cowbells. Thank you. He's going to be handing out more cowbells. We would like you to use these cowbells throughout our presentation every time you hear something that makes sense to you or that hits a nerve or that makes you think, huh, I never really thought of it that way or, oh yeah, I can use that in my business. I just want to hear a little jingle. Don't worry, there's not enough of you to make any kind of a big, huge ruckus, but we also want people to hear that it's more than just one little thing. And we're modeling our culture for you. When do you do it? When? Who can tell me? When, when do you do it? All the time. Every day. Who said that? Raise your hand. Awesome. Oh, I love the cowbell. Thank you. That's right. All the time, every day. That's what makes it your culture. You stay on top of it. So that's what you guys are going to do for us here today. What do we mean by promotion? So you'll see the top three things are in green. I have a lot of words on this page. Every time you see a slide that has a lot of words, it's because it's important ideas that I want to filter into your brain, but I don't want to have to say every single word and, and bore you to pieces. So it's up there, but I'm not going to read it to you. The top three, those are the obvious things. The bottom four, those are the less obvious, but very, very much as important as the top three. The bottom ones are the ones that really matter to us, but the top three are the ones that everybody else thinks about. Anybody have any questions about that? Anybody agree with this? Good, good. Oh, I'm feeling good right now. Yay. I'm calming down. Thank you. All right. Derek, you're up. Yep. So. Why do you want to do this? Well, obviously, there's benefits to the bottom line of your company. 
It's also great for your staff. Your staff want to feel like they're moving along in their life. And of course, for the competitive value, as your employees get better and grow, it's good for everyone. Now, those that have attended any of our presentations in the past know that Liz and I like to refer to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This goes back to human psychology, and the idea is at the bottom you have your base needs. Anybody you ever heard of this? Anyone? Oh, a lot of yep. you. At the bottom you've got your basic needs, your physiological. You need a place to eat, live, you need food, you need sustenance. Next level up is safety. After that comes social, we're social beings. We like to have friends and do some interaction. Above that is basically esteem, confidence, a sense of achievement. And the top level is self-actualization, which means becoming the best you you can be. Now, the way this works is to get to the top of the pyramid, you've got to have each tier underneath it. But the higher you get on the pyramid, the more motivating it is for people and the more lasting it is, as opposed to the ones at the very bottom. Anything to add? No? You're on next. OK. I'm not going to say anything else. So ways to motivate. Obviously, you've got things like base pay, benefits, bonuses and perks, incentives, tracking, caring, recognition. But we think the biggest one of all of these is promotion. Now, anyone notice anything about the order we put these in? No? OK. Not very many people. You're going to no, have to clarify. They're not being very engaged. And no, they're being very engaged. Okay. So you're not making a good point. I guess I'm not making a good point. Right? OK. Told you. <laughs> I get to do a presentation tomorrow and make you look bad. Just remember that part. But at the very top of the list are the bottom items on the hierarchy needs. Your employees need to make a decent pay so they can have a place to live, feed their family, and support themselves. We move up into some of the social issues, like feeling that they're in a caring environment and people care about them. But recognition and promotion and feeling like they're becoming the best person they can be, like their life is going somewhere, like they're achieving things, those are those top two tiers of needs. Those are the ones that motivate them the most and have the longest lasting effect. Yeah. I do love that, Derek, yeah. actually. Uh, isn't this one? Mm -hmm. Okay. You're up. Steps are creating. All right. So these are the actual steps to creating a culture, any culture. So we talked about how easy it is, and there are just three main things, but these are the steps that it's actually going to take. You have to provide an opportunity. You have to have an incentive for them. You have to give them some encouragement, support them when they begin, Give them recognition when they do whatever it is that they're doing, and then repeat this process. Now, an example of op opportunity would be, well, we have a lot of op examples coming up, but I want to just talk a little bit about what opportunity is. It means that it's some place that they see is possible for them to go. Now, some of you are thinking, but my company is so small. How can I have opportunity in my company? There's not. There's not room for them to grow. There's no opportunity for them. There is. There's always opportunity. Even if your company's only this big and it's you and just one other person, guess what? There's opportunity for them. Maybe not directly inside your company today, but maybe tomorrow. Or maybe the skills that they're learning today can lead to something outside of your company. Right? There's a lot of different things that we learn and that we teach that can be used outside of our specific businesses. Great. Incentives. Has anybody ever seen this We FM? Somebody, yes. Somebody has heard of it. It stands for what's in it for me. So when you're providing incentive for people, you need to be talking about what's in it for them. Does that sound more familiar? No? Oh, it does to some people. Oh, it does. OK, good. And encouragement. That's pretty easy. Do you guys have an idea of what encouragement sounds like? Yes. I feel very encouraged when I hear that bell. You know what? When I don't hear it, I'm like, uh-oh, Derek, can you take this? And you, you go, I feel nervous okay. right now. So I'm not going to let you know. So, Encouragement sounds like something to people. It sounds like, yeah, you're doing OK. Go ahead. So what might I need right now? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Because that's what we all need. A little bit of encouragement can go a long way. You think your employees are any different? They're not. Support. 
Once they do whatever it is that they're trying to do, you have to support them. They are not going to be amazing. They're not. Get used to that idea and you still have to support them. Help them feel like they're amazing and they'll get better. They'll be more amazing. They're not gonna be amazing from the get-go, but you have to support them while they're learning. You wouldn't take that one-year-old that's learning how to walk and when he falls down the first time go, stupid kid's never gonna walk. Of course not. He falls down, you pick him up. He falls down again, you pick him up. He falls down again, you pick him up. When do you stop picking him up? Who can tell me? When do you start picking him up? When do you stop? <laughs> when you die or he stops falling, right? <laughs> if he stops falling, you don't need to pick him up anymore. But until then, don't you pick him up every single time? Yes, a lot of you pick him up every single time. Those people that didn't ring your bells, what do you guys do? You stop picking him up? No? Just curious. So we pick our kids up every time they fall and our employees as well. If we have put them in a position when they fall, we pick them up every time. And then give recognition. So when the little guy, he falls down and you pick him up, do you yell at him, stupid kid, you fell? Yes or no? No? Are you guys here? You don't. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> I'm glad you don't. Apparently, other people might. I'm nervous. Okay, thank you. Whoever that was, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. You give them recognition. You give them recognition for what they're doing well. If you tell the one-year-old when he falls, and you stand him back up, that's okay. Keep going, keep trying. You give him recognition. Agreed? Thank you. And then you repeat the process over and over again. Great. Well, now it's on to talking about who are the employees that you would want to promote. So how do you define your best employee? This is actually going to vary. So we've got a list of questions up here. And you may look at this and go, well, gosh, this is obvious. Uh, but it's actually going to vary a lot by different companies. For example, in my residential cleaning company, we use solo cleaners. So I highly value independent thinking and problem solving skills. Those that use teams, they might not like those skills quite as much or might not need them quite as much. I have all of two people in my office to run a relatively large company. So I don't want them calling in and asking questions. I want them out there that as they run into things, they're able to fix it. I don't value things like sales skills. They work alone a lot. So teamwork, I mean, it's nice that they help each other out, but I'll be honest, not a major uh, priority of mine. In fact, I just assigned a new supervisor and gave her five uh, people to report to, and I realized she's never met any of these people until I made them her boss, because that's kind of how things work out in our company. We don't interact that much. So independent thinking, enjoying working alone, those are key skills for us that we look for. A lot of you in the room probably wouldn't agree on that. Now, once you find those people, you want to support them and grow them over time. And we have a couple examples in our company. Uh, a couple of years ago, one of my cleaners worked her way up to running my office, and then she opened her own branch, which she's partial as owners of, out in Dayton. And now, just about two weeks ago, we have another cleaner named Randy, who's worked her way up, worked in my office for a while, and is now out running her own branch. This is great because when it was just the one person, it was kind of a fluke. It was a unicorn. Oh, yeah, that one person, you know, his favorite in the office, you know, maybe they had a little thing on the side. He gave her partial ownership of the company. Well, now all of a sudden, there's two employees that run their own offices, now three employees. It's becoming a culture, and everyone knows that this is where our employees go, that if they do what they're supposed to, over time, they get to run their own company, be an owner in our business. Go ahead. So we talked a lot about possibility. Derek is telling you about the people and why it matters because that's the first thing, right? If you don't have people to promote, there's nothing to do. So you have to have people. They have to have possibility and you have to provide that. One of the best ways to provide opportunity is sort of built into most companies and that's in your growth ladder. How do you promote people? How Oh no, how is, sorry, that was a little confusing. How is your company set up? How is your company structured? So there are some basic structures that we think of, and there are three. We have two listed here. We have the tall, 
organizational chart and we have the flat organizational chart. We're going to talk about another style in a minute, but these are the top two that most people think of. These are the top eight considerations. Communication, you're going to have different things that are going to happen if you have, or when we're talking about communication, depending on which, which style you have. So if you have tall, the communication style is gonna have more distortion. There's going to be more delay. If you have a flat org chart, you're going to have fast communication. It's going to be more clear. I'm going to go forward real quick here to show you a picture of the flat and a picture of the tall. Oh, how do we go backwards on this? Bring me back, thanks Derek. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I want you guys to see that it matters what you choose. When you are deciding about opportunities, it's not just about the people. We talked about it's really important who the people are, but you also have to pick the people that match your organization and you have to make sure that your organization is designed around the type of people that you can bring into your company. Because we bring in a certain type of people to our companies, everybody. I'm not saying that I bring in the same people that Derek does or that I bring in the same people that you do, but your company tends to attract its own type of people. And so you need to make sure that your organizational structure matches what you are attracting. And additionally, as we make changes and things evolve, prices go up, we have um, a minimum wage goes up, which we're all dealing with, right? We're going to be attracting different people. So we need to make sure that we're thinking about all of these things at that same time. All right, I don't wanna read this over, but if you have a certain structure type, hopefully you can read your, your uh, features. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Have you had a chance to look at your type? No. Oh, somebody has, Jen has. Okay, good. I'm gonna give you another second then, and since only a couple people have had a chance to look at it, is there confusion about this chart? No, okay, good. Then I'm just gonna give you one more second, and I'm moving on. Maybe. Got it? Okay. All right. Go so ahead, this sir. is your flat organization chart. This is actually the organization chart we put in place with my maid service when we first started out. Pretty darn simple. We got our techs, we got our general manager, we got a salesperson, we got the CEO of the company. Um, doesn't take a lot of explanation. A lot of you have probably seen an org chart that looks like this, and it's pretty traditional. The advantages of a flat org chart like this is communication is very easy. Um, it doesn't feel bureaucratic. Part of the reason why when I first started I had an org chart like this is because I used to work for Procter & Gamble out there on the show floor where I had like four different bosses at different times. And, I wanted something simple and easy. Uh, it's very easy to get to know the techs and have a relationship. So that's kind of the, some of the advantages with that model. Another example is the tall organization chart. This is an organization chart of Tom Stewart, who is one of our friends and business partners. And this is your more typical bureaucratic chart, where you've got you know, trainees reporting to other trainees, a very clear hierarchy, very clear who reports to who, chain of command type setup. Some of your advantages on this one is very clear who reports to who, who has what roles. You know, when you go back to my organization chart, I only had two roles on there. One was sales manager, one was basically office assistant. So who's responsible for all the other tasks that aren't as clear? On a tall org chart, a lot of that's a lot clearer. Um, it's got a very narrow span of control, so it makes it simple. You know, when you have a flat organization, you can have 10, 15, 20 employees reporting to you. Here you have three to five employees. It's a much narrower area of control. So there's a lot of advantages to this as well. But there's another possibility. And this is the hybrid org chart. Hi, Tricia. Did you get your, your cowbell? Good, I'm glad. All right. The hybrid org chart is something that not a lot of people have heard of. If you have not heard of it, I recommend that you pull out your camera, take a picture of it. We're also going to give you the words that are related to the org chart, so you can take a picture of that too to help explain it. 
I'm going to go over just really briefly what this org chart represents because it has some odd, odd titles in it that a lot of people don't understand. My company is based on a, a sports theme, and so the entire lexicon in my company is around a sports theme. So you'll notice at the top, the owner, and then there's a head coach, a lead manager, we have team managers up here on the right, we have an equipment manager up here on the left, we have an outfield, we have an infield, the infield are the people working in the office, the outfield are the people working out in the field, the dugout is out where we keep all of the equipment and supplies. You see we have team coaches, we have assistant coaches down here at the bottom, we have team players. These are all normal positions that you might have in a typical cleaning company, just structured in a little bit different way. The advantages of having the hybrid are mixed. You get some of the best of both worlds. And if you have a sense of wanting to do a little bit more and wanting to grow your company into a, different, a little bit different place, you might need a hybrid. All right, does everybody understand this hybrid version? Well, I have, Yay. I have one quick question for you, Liz. Yeah. Sure looks like you have an awful lot of employees on that org chart. Huh? All right, so Derek is making a good point. You can have this org chart and only have 15 employees because a lot of times on a hybrid and also on a tall, you might have one employee holding multiple positions. For example, in my company, my, one of my team coaches is also my equipment manager. So it might look like, oh my gosh, you must have at least 70 employees. I don't, I only have 30 techs and they're all, uh, on this on this chart. Is that what you want to know? Yep, Kurt? basically. Okay. All right, so these are some of the advantages. If you want to know what they are, and remember, take a picture really quickly because I'm moving on. Moving. The people. Yep. These are the people that we have at my company. <laughs> Anybody recognize them? Yeah. Yep, now we're talking about incentives. And one of the keys on incentives is it's gotta be unique to the person, which means you gotta know the employees a little bit. What motivates one person is gonna be different from what motivates another person. Uh, can you think of any examples, Liz? Off the top of my head, the first thing that's coming to mind is, I'm going to use our, our culture here today. The incentive to you for using your cowbells is I'm going to talk to you. Those that are using your cowbells I'm looking at you more, aren't I? Jen, you're getting a little bit more of my eye contact, aren't you? You're getting a little bit more of mine. Denise, you're getting a little bit more of mine. Those that are using the cowbells, you're getting a little bit more engagement. You're going to go home with a little bit different message than the rest of the people. If you're not engaged, you go home with less. That's the incentive to you to do what I want you to do in our example today of our engagement culture. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Dues. You're up. What? Am I up? You're up for dues. Oh, I'm up for dues. You give me all that the negative fast. slides, you remember? Yes, I do. I reordered everything at last minute, and Derek was like, no, 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 that's a bad idea. Oh, it'll be fine. Yeah, he might have been right on this one. All right. So the do's, these are things that you really, really have to do when you are trying to create a culture of promotion. If you don't do these things, you're going to end up with some problems. They're not gonna be huge problems, but it will never come together the way you want it to come together. The first one is, it needs to be earned. It, you can't just throw promotions at people. Hey you, I need a new, in my case, team coach, you're it. That won't work. They need to earn this position in some way. They need to earn my respect and feel like they have earned the, at least the right to be promoted into the position. The next thing is they have to be a good fit. If they're not a good fit, they're going to suck, for lack of a better word. Anybody ever promoted somebody into a position and they sucked? You hear a lot of cowbell, right? That's the loudest it's probably been since we started. We've all been in that situation. You promote somebody and you realize, ugh, what the heck was I thinking? This person is not good, so make sure they're a good fit. The next thing, it can't lead to a dead end. It shouldn't. If it does, ugh, what's going to happen is you're gonna get somebody in that position and you've just alleviated your problem of them thinking that this is a dead end job and then what'd you do? You put them right back in that position. 
So a lot of people in our industry don't like our job because they think it's a dead end job. The culture of promotion says, hey, this isn't a dead end job. Come on, you're going to love it. We've got all sorts of stuff for you. It's going to be awesome. And then we say, oh, never mind. This is it. So make sure there's somewhere else. And if you don't have somewhere else inside your company, what can they do outside your company? The next thing is, there, you need to have all of the good stuff and the bad stuff explained to them initially. A lot of times, we want to be really positive and have that good positive attitude. So we want to tell them all the great stuff about the job. And then we forget to tell them that, oh, you got to be to work at four in the morning. And then what happens on day two, when they have to go to work at four in the morning? They hate this job. Yeah? Liz needs a lot of encouragement. Derek, not so much. But Liz needs a lot. Okay. Opportunities should be based on past performance. Well, that was scary. Halloween feeling. Woo, spooky. All right. I'm going to let it go. I don't think we can hear over it. All right, sorry about that. The opportunity should be based on past performance. This is similar to it must be earned, but slightly different because sometimes they have earned the position outside of your company. Um, being based on past experience, what I mean there is in your company. So if you're going to promote them, you want to base it specifically on what things they've already done. Oh, let's see. I wanted to talk about a pay increase, but I didn't want to scare people. When we're talking about pay increases, it doesn't have to be a big pay increase. But typically people, most of us here, think of promotions and pay increases as going together. Is that you guys? So because of that, if you try to promote somebody and you don't give them a pay increase, they're going to feel like it's a promotion in name only, and it is in some ways, and they will not be as vested in the promotion. Does that make sense? <gasps> I love it. I found the magic question. Does that make sense? I love it. <laughs> All right. You want to help the candidates to overcome their natural fear because when we promote into a new position, and this is all of us again, even when we're taking on any new experience, there's a natural tendency to feel uncomfortable. As business owners and entrepreneurs, we're more comfortable with being in that position and feeling that way. But a lot of our technicians are not initially, so you need to support them in that. You also need to have opportunities for anybody of value. So what I mean here is sometimes we are so busy focusing on what we have going on in our company that we hire somebody that's a good fit for our company, they have really great value, but they don't fit into one of our specific roles. You need to be thinking broader if you want to have a culture of promotion. I'm not saying you have to do this. You can just set up your org chart and these are the three positions and that's that. But if you want a culture of promotion where everybody thinks it's what you believe, it's what, what you do, and when you do it, you have to have something for everybody of value. All right, so now we're on to the don'ts because I always get the negatives in this. And one of them is don't push. And you have to be careful on this one because sometimes you don't feel like you're pushing, but they want to make us happy, they want to please us, so sometimes you can put a lot of subtle pressure on them that you don't realize. So be careful not to push them into a job they're not ready for or they don't want. Second example we've got up there is don't promote someone who isn't ready for the position or responsibility. You know, a lot of times we put people in a role they shouldn't have and they fail, and that's our fault if they haven't built the skills necessary. So often what I do is I test them out ahead of time. Basically give them a test drive, give them some of the job duties just to see how they do. And only once we feel comfortable they have the skills and they've built them do we actually formally promote them. So we don't even tell them we're doing this. We'll just say, oh gosh, we need some help today. Can you help us out and see how they do with it? Give them a little coaching, see how it goes. And if they pick up on it, then I have the discussion. We don't tell them, hey, I'm thinking of making you, you know, my quartermaster, the person in my office who takes care of our equipment, until I make sure they've got some mechanical aptitude, because then when I don't give it to them, they're upset. 
Instead, I let them know I've got an emergency, I hand them some equipment, I ask them to fix it, see if they do any good. If they do, maybe that's a position that would work for them. <sighs> Definitely don't automatically assume a good technical worker is going to be a good manager. Uh, a Who's lot done this? Who's done this? That's a great cleaner. I'm going to turn her into my quality manager, right? Ugh. Or how many people promote their best cleaner to be their trainer? Training's an entirely different thing versus actually cleaning. Yeah. You have to be able to have very difficult conversations with people. A really good cleaner will be much more comfortable just cleaning it themselves. All right? Uh, you don't want to promote people just because. Um, and what I mean by that is primarily time. Well, gosh, everyone else has been promoted, and this person hasn't had anything yet. Once again, they have to earn it. If they haven't done something to earn it, they're going to know it's hollow. They're going to know it's a giveaway. And it's going to demotivate some of the people who are working hard in the organization. Who sometimes feels bad for that person that hasn't been promoted? I just feel bad for them. Everybody else has been promoted. Amy, I'm thinking of you right off the top of my head. That's hard. It like hurts your little heart, right? That's what he's talking about. If you do that, you damage your culture. So if you're trying to create a culture, don't be undermining it at the exact same time. And then finally, don't forget about the quiet people. A lot of times, we only notice the people who make a lot of noise in our organizations. And I've had people all the time tell me, I don't have somebody that can fill these roles. And when we go in and help them and start talking to people, we find out they have a lot more talent than they think. But people who don't, haven't managed before assume people notice them just by doing their job. And a lot of times, that's not true. Um, believe it or not, I'm a little shy sometimes. And I was one of the quiet employees that didn't always get noticed. And that can be frustrating and make you maybe quit a job and move careers, et cetera. And as a result, you want to make sure you're paying attention. Look at the people you don't pay attention to over time. And you'd be surprised. Some of those people have talents you don't realize. Ah, very true. All righty. We're going to talk a little bit about the promotional process here real quickly. But we're going to give you an example. Because a lot of times we know all of these things, we see them in bullet points, and we're like, oh yeah, 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 I know that, I know that. But then when you go to do it, it's like, oh, it's a little bit more difficult, it's a little sticky, right? So we want to give you a little example here. So Derek is my surprisingly shy <laughs> employee over here, but I'd like to promote him. And so I want to make the decision to promote him first. And I'm thinking about it. Why do I want Derek? Well, I have my own reasons, which I'm going to explain to him in a minute. And then I need to make the offer, right? So the offer in my company would sound something like this. Hey, Derek, I have been noticing that you've been doing a lot of things a little bit different some, than some of the other techs lately. And I want to talk to you about a new position. Are you up for that conversation? Uh, OK, I'm sure. OK, so I'm thinking about you for our assistant coach position. And this is why. I've noticed that you're really good with the paperwork. You're always ready to back the coach. You never have big arguments with the coach. And you tend to have focus on what our customers want first, which you know is one of our core values. So I really like that. I'd like to see you practice more of your leadership potential. I I'm flattered, and I'm glad you trust me that much. but. Don't you like manage people and like, I don't know, I don't like conflict. So right here, I have to be careful not to push. I talked to you earlier about not pushing. This is where that comes in. So I have to feel him out just a little bit more and see if he is a good candidate. I believe he is, but I don't want to push him if he's not ready. And this is what that would sound like. All right, so Derek, the. You're right, you do have to manage people. I know it's a little uncomfortable for you, but part of this position is the training. You know that, right? It's yeah. six months worth of training, and you also get the leadership courses. Every month you're gonna be in leadership training, and we are going to help you learn how to do that. So right now it might feel like you can't do it, yeah. and we're not gonna put you in the position right now. We're, our plan would be to train you, and then when you're ready, promote you to that position. I'm not asking you to do it right now, just what do you think about going into the training for the position? Does that sound better or? Yeah, no, I, I can do training, that's okay. I just wanna make sure I don't have to manage people right away. Right now, he says, yeah, that's okay. He's ready to go. The other flip side of that is? You know, I, I just, I don't wanna be responsible. I don't like responsibility. And now I'm not gonna push. 
He's given me the answer twice that he's not happy. Don't push. All right, well, do you think we could have another conversation in a few months if I'm noticing additional skills that I think might be helpful in the company? Yeah, I'd love to help the company out. I just okay. I don't want to deal with people. Not in that way. Not that way. All right, I'm going to continue to look for other opportunities for you. So I'm not cutting him off the knees. I'm not telling him he doesn't belong in our company or that we don't want him, but I'm going to continue helping him. All right, that's the offer. The incentive to him was, did you guys hear the incentive? Nobody heard it. Some people heard it. All right, so I'm going to clarify what the incentive was to him. That he's uncomfortable with people. He's going to get some leadership training. He's going to learn how to handle and manage people better. So his life will be better, not just his job. Is that more clear? Okay, good. Well, and once again, the incentive can vary. You know, I just oh, yeah. offered a new leadership role in my company. My office management thought I was crazy because we're offering like a very tiny raise for this job, and they said nobody's ever going to take this role. But what happened is we offered them the opportunity to build their team, the people they wanted to work with, and they loved that idea. Instead of being in a company full of strangers, they were going to build the team they wanted to work with them, hire them, train them, select them, fire them. And I had eight people apply for the job when I only needed three. Yep. All right, the next step is the training. You need to have a training process for anything, any position that you want to put somebody into. Part of why you are having a training process is so that the people appreciate that this is a promotion and that they are doing something more than they were doing before and it is something that they actually have to learn how to do. If you give them training, it's much easier to support them when they mess up. Does that make sense? Yay, good. Next is the bling. So the bling is the stuff that goes along with the promotion that makes them feel like they got a promotion. It might be a name tag that says team coach. It might be a jacket that has their name on it. It might be ribbons on a badge. There's some bling that goes along with the promotion. Who here doesn't believe in bling? Nobody? A couple of people. A couple of people don't believe in bling. Let me just give you one example. The military believes in bling. They give out all sorts of badges, don't they? Yeah. The police force, they believe in bling. Everybody that has a large company believes in some type of bling. Might be a nameplate, it might be a different jacket, might be a windowed cubicle. There's bling. Make sure that the bling is noticeable and that everybody understands how the value is made for them. The support, make sure you're giving them support. We've already talked a lot about that. Next steps or repeat. Are they going to go into a next step? Maybe into a new position? If not, just repeat the process. The steps revisited. Do you remember in the beginning we talked about the steps? Opportunity, incentive, encourage, support. Recognition and repeat, does everybody remember that? All right, good. The opportunity as an example for our engaged culture here, the opportunity was the cowbells. Do you see that? Yay. The incentive was what? Who can tell me the incentive? Say it again. That's right, somebody pays really good attention. Yes! You get additional understanding, you get the additional eye contact, you get more engaged, you remember more. When you go home, you can create a culture of promotion. Those without the engagement are going to struggle much more than he is. He's gonna have an easier time. Encouragement, what's the encouragement to you? How did we encourage you? We kept reminding you, we pointed out when you did it well, we nodded, we said yay, we said thank you. That was the encouragement to you. The support, how did we support you? We made sure that you had cowbells, we made sure that everybody knew what we wanted. When you didn't do it, we nicely reminded you that we needed more encouragement, right? Is this all making sense? Okay. And the recognition, you guys got it and repeat. 
but we're not going to repeat because we're done. We do have a question for you, though. Why not? Why not have a culture of promotion in your company? Why not? Why not? Questions and answers right now. Anybody have any questions for us? If you do, we'd appreciate if you'd stand and someone will bring you a microphone. We've got about five minutes for questions and answers. Angela, would you please stand? With the leadership training program you were talking about that Derek could have gone into, is there an additional pay increase for that? How we do our, I'll let Derek explain how he does his. Uh, when we are promoting somebody, when they accept the position uh, to go into training, we give them half of the amount. So if the position is going to pay an additional 50 cents per hour, they'll get 25 cents to go into training, and they'll go through training on this 25 cent amount, and then after they complete training, they'll get the other 25 cents. We Anybody else? Please stand up. How important okay. is it to clearly define the new role, exactly what's expected, have it in writing, have them sign it like a job description? We didn't address this here today intentionally because a lot, there is a lot of conflict right now about this. We believe, Derek yes. and I both believe, that it's very, very important, that it be very, very clear exactly what it is. We did talk a little bit about it when we said tell them the good and the bad. We tried not to address that. Thanks a lot for bringing that up. Somebody give him some cowbell over there. Because we were nervous about giving that, that information because we know that there are some people that don't agree with that. They think they should leave it more open to interpretation so that the people can grow into the position. We believe that it's better to set it and put people in it and then measure them on that. We really believe in and measurement I, as well. My personal job descriptions have the formal job description and then we have what we call day in the life where we just kind of write, this is what your average day is going to look like. So we want them to have the formal job description, but also understand, if I held this job, this is what my day is going to look like. I'm going to hire somebody. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this, good and bad. So they'll know what that day flow is going to be like and whether or not they're ready for it. Is that what you're looking for? OK. Stand up if you have a question. We can't really see your hands with the lights in our eyes. And they'll bring you a mic. Thank you. Is that you, Heather? Yeah. yeah? Go ahead and sit down until he's done, and then you can pop up again. Thank you. I just want to repeat the first question for Derek. <laughs> yes, yeah, he Sorry, cut me Roger. off, but that's okay. Sorry, and, Derek. And then second question is, um, Liz doesn't kind of, like me. It's what okay. kind of uh, position uh, uh, titles, or is there any importance in choosing a title that sounds better or more, so people can? Uh, sure. Well, I'll answer the first it. question. And I'm a little bit different than Liz. I don't pay people while they're a difference while they're in the training program. I the principle we have is. You prove you can do the job, and then you get the title and the money that goes with it. Um, so, and we're very clear about that. So there's no big surprise. Haven't had a lot of pushback, and they understand that. And it takes some of the pressure off. I'm not paying them for a job they don't have yet. You know, when you're paying them more, sometimes they feel that the expectation's more. As far as title, it doesn't have to be an impressive sounding title. A lot of it, once again, goes back to culture. I've got a corporate, semi, in some ways, military culture. So, you know, what, what do you call your person who takes care of your equipment? Equipment manager. Yeah, equipment manager. Mine's the quartermaster. I mean, it doesn't sound that fancy, but it explains what the job is, lets people know. Um, we both have culture coaches, so there's some differences. It doesn't have to be a fancy title. But it does have to be a title that fits your culture. Yes. So that really is critically important. They need to feel like in your company, this position has meaning and importance. That's where, that's where the importance is. It doesn't have to be. I was talking with somebody. Oh, gosh, I wish I could remember who it was. I was talking with somebody, and when I talked to her about just changing the title of her new employees, we call them rookies in my company, she calls them trainees, and we talked about just shifting that to intern. For her, she was like, oh, I love that. I feel like that's so much better. And that's how your employees feel. When they have a title that matches what they're trying to do, they feel better, and they're more willing. Heather was... Did you still have a question? I guess I just wanted to um, 
confirm my thinking on this is when you send the person into training, they get half of the increase with your company mm -hmm. up front for going into training. Mm -hmm. They don't work out during the training period. I imagine you do a lot of discussion before they start about pay and like, we've had some team leads in my company that have had life changes or whatever and after a while, the position is no longer a good fit, at least for that period of time until they get themselves together. And um, well, how do you handle um, if training doesn't work out or a new supervisory position doesn't work out and then they lose that increase mm -hmm. without um, making them feel demoralized? Like, what's that conversation like for you? I mean, we try to simplify the conversation. Instead of saying that you're going to get this money and if you don't work out, we're going to take the money away, we tie the money to the position. So this position pays this. So if they no longer have that position, they're not expecting that pay because the other position that they've now fallen back to pays this. So rather than taking any money away, we're just paying them the same value that that position has always paid. Does that make sense? And it's yeah. also just not about the money. We also thank them. You know, we really appreciate that you took the risk. We both learned a lot. You know, we like it when people step forward, even if it doesn't work out. I use some examples of times when I've tried new things and they didn't work out so good for me, and encourage them to try new positions in the future. Yep. We're done. All right, we have time for one more question. Is anybody? Oh, we must have done well, yep. Derek. Yes. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Say, those are for day, me, right? not you. Say again. Those are for me, not you. Of course. Oh. Tresha, did you have another question? I guess right. you want to stop. One